Thank you, yeah. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Jesus is really is worth all the pageantry and praise that he gets this time of year. <laughs> I tell you, the Lord is just awesome in what he does. Yeah, hand me that mic. I'll just put it right up here. All right. Yes, glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. And, and, and it's so good to be able to sing those praises to the Lord and express our heart and our joy. You know, it's just kind of this one time of year type time where we uh, go into these areas of life uh, that, we, that we seem to move into with our songs, with our music, with our praise, with our messages, with our thoughts. Uh, I've said this before that it, I, you know, I don't know how a lot of these, the artists that put out Christmas albums, you know, those Christmas albums are put out, probably they go into a studio in July sometime, and they're in there singing about the, you know, the, the it came up on a midnight clear and uh, all these kind of things, and it just seems so unseasonal at that time. It's like, have you, have you ever done anything like singing Joy to the World or something like that in July? Does, does it kind of have a little different? feel to it than it does when you sing it in December. Yeah, it just kind of seems right now. You know, it just seems like the right thing to do and, and to do it. But, uh, but we, we praise the Lord. We love the Lord because after all, uh, the ultimate present in this world is the presence of Jesus. The greatest gift in all the world is the presence of Jesus. And I want to share with you this morning, just, just quickly, three reasons why Jesus came. Three reasons for the, uh, for the babe of Bethlehem. And, uh, and let's see if the Lord can speak to our heart about this. Three reasons why Jesus came to us. Number one, Jesus came to erase all of the misconceptions about God. Now, in this ever-darkening world that we're living in now, and it is ever darkening, isn't it? It seems like a new evil every day. Evil on top of evil. The things, the foundations that we've held to all of our life are being shaken. It is a, certainly a time of testing and a time of trial. Not only for we as Christians, but for the entire world. One of the reasons why Jesus came is so that he could erase the misconceptions that this world has about God. Because some believe that God is very distant. Some believe that God doesn't want to bless you, that God wants to destroy you. That God's looking for a reason to hurt you in some way. That God has the Ten Commandments in one hand and a baseball bat in the other, and he's just waiting for you to mess up. Many believe that God somehow takes pleasure in, in their pain. And because of the families that some of you and others were brought up in this world, you've always viewed God as being hard and, and, and merciless. And that he might even be neurotic or psychotic or, or, or bipolar, but he's at least depressed, you know. But at least part of the Christmas story, at least part of the reason that Jesus came was to erase all of those misconceptions that we have about God. Let me give you an example. This is the, this is the disciple John writing in the first chapter of his gospel in verse 18, here's what John says. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. What John is saying here is that in order for God to be exposed in this world, it took someone who uniquely knew God that Jesus is the only begotten son. Everybody say, he's unique. Yeah, he is uniquely qualified to tell us about God because he is the unique son of God. Now, we've all been adopted in as, as, we, get, as we trust Christ and get saved, but Jesus is begotten of God the only begotten Son of God, who, who, who thrives in the, uh, the Scripture says, the bosom of the Father. 
That, that's talking about intimate, intimate relationship. So the son who is unique and has a very intimate relationship is the one who can e express God, can, or, or, can, can bring him out so that we can see him, can, can interpret him for us, can, can give us a real view of God. So Jesus came as God in human skin so that this world could see God the way he is. Bet Milner, Bet Midler, how many of you have ever heard that? Now, if you do, you, you age you, you probably You probably age yourself some, right? <laughs> Us old folks know Bette Midler. And some of you young folks know a couple of the songs that she's done, I'm sure. Uh, one, 1979, called The Rose. It's probably still being done at all kind of ceremonial kind of things now. And then in 1988, The Wind Beneath My Wings was a big hit. In 1990, she came out with a song that um, extolled the virtue of looking at the earth from a distance. Mm -hmm. Now, it, had, it was a beautiful song, had some tremendous concepts in it, but one concept that it shared was that God was watching us from a distance. Mm -hmm. Now, the only thing wrong with that is that it's wrong. <laughs> God is not watching us from a distance. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, said that one day the Messiah will come to this earth and his name shall be called Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? God with us. When Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary looked at him and, and they said, his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Yeah. So Jesus is not looking at a distance. God is not looking at a distance. He's right here with us. And the same John that, that I'll just remind you that knew Jesus intimately he was the John that laid his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper and said, Master, is it me who's going to betray you? He called himself the one that Jesus loved. Here's what he said about all of the things to do with God. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in verse 14 it said, and, 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 we be, and, and, and the word became flesh, yeah. and we beheld him yeah. as of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace. He's not watching us from a distance. He's right here with us. When you, when you walk to the grave of that loved one that you, that, that you love so dearly and you're standing at the edge of the grave looking at a life that, has, that you've admired and has been lost, God is with you. He's not looking at you from a distance saying, I'm sorry, these kind of things happen. God is with you. When you walk into the emergency room with your little baby burning up with fever, you don't walk in there alone. God walks in there with you. When you are at the lowest place in your life and you don't know what to do and you have no hope for the future and no help for the now, God is with you. The message of Christmas is that God is with us right here, right now, and forever. Yeah. You know what Jesus came to reveal? Jesus came to reveal who God is. God is not this distant cosmic killjoy that you have the misconception of thinking. God is not like that at all. To reveal what God thinks, what God does, how God acts, how God feels, how God loves. Remember, Jesus went to the down and outs, the up and outs, the people who didn't believe in themselves. Jesus went and was a friend of sinners. That was one of the charges that got him crucified. This guy is a friend of sinners. 
So I don't know what your concept of God is. Maybe you think that God is some kind of cosmic uh, holiness that's so far out there that he can't be touched. Maybe you think that he is unsympathetic and, 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 and judgmental and, and harsh and can't be pleased and can't be enjoyed. But Jesus came and Jesus lived. He sought out people whose lives were broken and hurting. He wanted to be with them and that's what Jesus is. Jesus came to show us what God is really like. Jesus was happy. God is happy. Jesus got angry. God gets angry. Jesus was excited and concerned and involved. Jesus enjoyed life. God enjoys life. God is not somebody sitting at a distance trying to take all the fun out of life. Are you guys having fun down there? Yeah, well, cut it out. Jesus came to show us what God really is. This is how God acts. This is how God feels. This is what God thinks about everything. He's walking around with flesh on so we could behold him and see him. And everything that Jesus expressed is how God is. Do you know that people love to be around Jesus? Especially sinners. They love Jesus. I submit to you that you don't like to be around somebody that makes you feel guilty or shamed or hurt or awkward in some way. You want to be around people that are kind and thoughtful and caring and you feel love you and care about you and are good, solid people. People invited Jesus to everything. The, a young couple in Cana of Galilee, was having, they were having their wedding. And they, and they said to Jesus, Jesus, uh, uh, will you come to our wedding? Yeah. Because it won't be the same if you're not there. Jesus said, I'll come to the wedding. And Jesus went to the wedding with his mother. I'm sure mom heard about the wedding and mom said, uh, can I go? And Jesus said, well, let me ask, can, can I bring my mom with me? Uh, yeah, you can go, mom. And they show up at the wedding and right in the middle of all the festivities, when the wedding is on the line, guys, when all of your friends and all your neighbors and all the people around you uh, are expecting you to take care of business and this to be a wonderful party and a wonderful time and it would be bad on you if you fail this. Yeah. You ran out of wine. Of all things to run out of. The hot sauce. This was not some little grape juice either. This was the real thing. Because they said... When, he, when his mama came to him and said, son, they need some wine. He said, what's that to me? You know why he said that to her? Because he didn't know when his ministry was supposed to start. You know who did know? His mama. He went home and he was subject to his mother and father. You remember at the temple when he was 12 and they found him and they said, boy, you better get in that wagon and get in there now and I better not have to tell you this again. And the Bible said Jesus went home and became obedient to his mother and his father. He became obedient to his mother. He's Jesus. He's God. And he obeys his mother and his father. And so he doesn't know when it's time to start your public miracle. And so mom knows because God's spoken to mom. God has the authority. So it will be mom that says, all right, son, it's time to go. Get it going. Make them, take this wine, water, turn it into wine. That's going to be the kickoff of your ministry. Jesus said, you, you, for real? Yeah, do it. And so she looked at those servants, and here's what she said to them. Whatever he says, you do it. Whatever he says, you do it. And they went and filled up all six water pots, and there's lots of symbolism in that, but filled them up to the very brim, brought them to Jesus. The water got sunburned in the presence of the glory of God, I suppose. When they sticked a dipper in and took it out, it wasn't water anymore, it was wine. And here's what they said. Hey, hey, hey Bubba, uh, 
Most people, <laughs> you know, they serve the good stuff at the beginning. When people aren't so drunk, they can't tell whether it's good or bad or don't care, you know. But you've done just the opposite. You've saved the good stuff until the end. Yeah. What's this all about? Jesus, and, and, and Jesus did that at a, that was his first public miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee because some little teenage bride and, and groom invited him because they liked Jesus. And they thought their wedding wouldn't be the same without Jesus. We spend our life looking for perfect presence and perfect presentations. But look, we don't need perfect presence. We need perfect presence. Yeah. The presence of God. Jesus came to this earth to show us the, the presence of God yeah. so we would no longer be confused about who God is and what God is. And everybody that met Jesus got the same three things. Yeah. The woman at the well, Nicodemus that came by night, uh, Peter, uh, Andrew and Peter, the two disciples, James and John. I mean, you just go down the list. Everybody that met Jesus, Jesus gave them three things. You know what they are? Number one, a past that is forgiven. Number two, a purpose for living. And number three, a home in heaven. All right, now. Yeah. Jesus yeah. gives all of us, God gives all of us a past that is forgiven. It's not a glory hallelujah. And a purpose for living yeah. right now. And a, a home in heaven one day. Let's just say that out loud. Let's just say it out loud. Let's see if we can get that in our spirit real quick here, all right? Because Jesus came, we have a past that is forgiven, a purpose for living, and a future in heaven. All right, let's say this. I have a past that's forgiven, and I have a purpose for living. And I have a future in heaven because Jesus came to reveal God. That's why Jesus came. Oh, holy. I love what the Apostle Paul tells the church at Ephesus. Here's, Paul's, here's what Paul says to the church at Ephesus, Ephesus 3. Look at it. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height yeah. to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the goodness of God. Yeah. Jesus came not only to erase the misconceptions of God, but he came to express the love of God. Yeah. We quoted it a moment ago, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, this might just be the way my crazy mind works, and, and this is not something that's going to get you into heaven, so don't be trying to tell Jesus this one day, all right? Just accept it for what it is now. My crazy mind... When I, I, I read that, I said, all right, Jesus came to erase the misconceptions. Jesus came to express the love of God. And of course, the most famous passage in the world about love is John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm sitting there reading that. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I've read that thousands of times. I've quoted it thousands of times. All of a sudden, I, I, I was reading, I'm wondering, if you took the whole Bible, everything in the Bible, and you wanted to express that in one sentence, what would be that sentence? 
Now, here's another thing I challenged myself, and I had to ask my resident uh, English major how, whether, what was, if this was true. I said, all right, what, to be a complete sentence, and now don't, don't roll your eyes back, all right? I'm just going to be a second. To be a complete sentence, what does a sentence have to contain? In order to be a complete sentence, what does it have to contain? She said, a subject and a verb. So like God loves would be a complete sentence. Justin went. You know, I mean, just, just a, a subject and a verb. So I said, all right, if I was going to make the, the, a complete sentence that showed everything that the Bible teaches us, what, what, would I, what would be my two words? And I thought about God loves, and that is true, he does love. For God so loves, loved the world, that he, but look at what his love produced. God so loved the world that he gave. The sentence is God gave. God loved so deeply that his love produced a giving that he gives. Why did he send Christ? Well, he loves, but not only that he loves, but he loves so deeply that it pushed him to give and he gave. And so Jesus came to show us not only what God was and what he thought and how he is, but also how he loves. And in Ephesians, I just read it and, and I, look at what it says about, about, about the Lord. He's talking, Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus about the love of God, which Jesus came to express. And he tells them, he says, he says I, I want you to get this so that you'll be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height of God's love for us. So, how wide is God's love? God's love is so wide that, that wherever you are, he can reach you. God's love is so wide that you can't go anywhere where God can't touch your life and God can't reach you. It doesn't matter how far you go. It doesn't matter how, 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 how hidden you may try to be and you try to hide away from God. God's love is all encompassing and God's love can reach you wherever you go because God's love is wide. And then he says God's love is long. How long is God's love? Well, God's love is so long that it lasts forever. <laughs> yeah, uh, Human love wears out. Human love gets weary. It grows old. It, sometimes separation, divorce, rejection, all those things. Uh, human love might not last forever, but God's love is long. And here's what God said about his love. His love is so long, he said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. I will never walk away from your presence and emotionally I will never turn my heart away from you. And when God says never, he means never. So his, his love is wide and his love is long and then how deep is God's love? Well, it, it, if you could, could get in the deepest pit imaginable, the deepest pit that you've ever been in, God's love goes all the way to the bottom of that pit and reaches in that pit and picks you up. You don't know the, the depth of God's love until you get into something that is so deep that there's no way you're gonna get out and all of a sudden the love of God comes down in the deepest pit that down in there with, I submit to you that if the love of God didn't go deep into a pit, most of us here would never know the Lord. Because our lives were so deep in the pit of sin 
that the love of God had to go into the depths of the pit of sin and come under us and pick us up and lift us out of that pit and say, I'm still with you and I still love you and I can change your life. His love is high. How high is God's love? Well, it's high. His love is so high that he can overlook all the bad choices that you've made. He can, look, he can overlook all the bad decisions that you've made. He can overlook all the mistakes and failures that you've made in life. That he can look, pick you up, look you in the eye, and say, you may have made a mistake, but you're not a mistake. And I can change your life. The love of God. Jesus came not only to erase misconceptions, but to express the love of God, how much God loves us. And that God will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. His love is so, is so wide and so long and so deep and so high that we can't run away from the love of God. And Jesus came to express that. Here's one other thing that he came to Bethlehem for, and that is Jesus came to enable our relationship with God. You know, before Jesus came, we couldn't have a relationship with God. Not a real one anyway. Oh, we could try to keep the commandments, but that was a futile effort at best. So Jesus came because God wants to have a personal relationship with you a personal love relationship with you that is real and personal. No, 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 I'm not talking about some cosmic joy. I'm not talking about some, some uh, solar experience. I'm not talking about uh, something that you read about in an encyclopedia. I'm telling you that Jesus came because God desires a personal, are you hearing the word personal? Not, not, not corporate. We, we know God loves all of us, and we know that God loves the world. But we're not talking about God loving the world or God loving this church or everybody. We're talking about God loving you. You, personal. That's right, Bill. Your personal relationship with God. And he wants it to be real. Not some phony, fake, plastic, uh, dash, Jesus, bobblehead experience. He wants that experience to be real. As real as love between uh, my wife and I. I mean, as, as real as, and, and the sense is there that, that God is, is right there and he loves me personally and, and, and he, wants me, he wants to be there with me forever. Let me, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you. How many of you, when you die, you want to go to heaven and live with God forever? Let me see you. All right, put them down. All right, how many of you, when you die, you want to go to hell and you want to burn forever? All right, great. So we're in agreement, right? Everybody in here is in agreement. We want to go to heaven when we die and live with God forever. Well, why would anybody want to go to heaven when you die and not want to have a relationship with God right now. The re you, know, you know why you need a relationship with God right now? Because you need him right now. <laughs> That's the key. I mean, hey, look, I know, I know we're all looking forward to going to heaven one day. And I, I, know, I know all of us, you know, uh, we have an eternity in our future and we want our future address to be uh, such and such a gray street, uh, downtown heaven. But your greatest need is now. And the reason I'm saying this is not because I think you're going to walk out that door and not make it back to church next week. The reason I'm telling you this is because I think you're probably going to live many years, barring the earth being here. You're going to live this thing many years, and you need him now. Do you know there's only one requirement for receiving Christ, 
And I know everybody thinks faith, and faith is important, and faith is something that you have to have. But let's go a little deeper than that. Let's go a little bit back before faith. What do you have to have? What, what does it, you say, Pastor, I want to receive Christ. I want to, go to he, I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to live forever. Uh, and I need Christ now. All right, what do I need? What, what, what trait do I need? What quality do I need? How, how can I approach God right now? All right, when I, say, when I tell you, you're going to say, oh. All right, here it is. Humility. That's so simple, right? Humility. Let me just show you. You know what humility says? He's God and I'm not. That's humility. He can save my soul. I can't save my own soul. He can change my life. I can't change my life. He can give me a better future. I can't, get, I, I can't control the future. I have no control over the future. He can recreate me in his image. And I can't recreate him. You know, this phrase we hear quite often now, and it's a good phrase. Jesus is the reason for the season. And I agree with that. I agree that Christmas is about, is about Jesus and the reason he came. But let me, let me throw one little thought that you might not have thought of. Why did Jesus come? He came for you. So in the heart of God, you are the reason for the season. God loves you. And he did it for you. And all it takes to open the door and allow him to change your life is humility. To say, God, I can't do anything about my mess. Only you can do something about this. And I surrender to you. And Jesus came so that you can have a real relationship with God, a personal relationship with God, because God's just crazy about you. I, I don't know if you know that. I, I hope I'm not telling you something you don't know. God is crazy about you. He loves you. He, 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 he does everything for us. He wants the best. He'll do, he'll do, he said, just tell me what it is that you need. Just come to my throne and just jump up in my lap and say, Daddy, I got a problem. And tell me what you need. That's what Hebrews 13 is all about. <laughs> because you come into a throne of mercy so that you can find grace to help in time of need. So bow your head with me one, one moment.